Hey Smokers, Drago on here, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, the behind-the-scenes stuff related to Kane Spam. Now, for those of you who don't know what Kane Spam is or didn't see the other video, it's a remade music video that I made based on the game Command & Conquer 3 Kane's Wrath about a decade ago, almost exactly a decade ago um, this month. Now. As the video title also says, I'm going to be explaining where I've been for the past three months. And unlike some other announcement videos that I've posted in the past, there's no excuses, there's been no issues, there's been no stress, there's been no health problems, there's, again, no excuses of any kind. I was only and solely working on this video. So you're probably thinking, wait, this video was only, what, four minutes long? Wait, what? Why did that take you three months? I don't understand. Well, it turns out that the video was a massive project to get all the parts of it working, um, the likes of which I will explain shortly. But um, for those of you who are only interested in the absolute skinny and can um, move on from this video, is... Uh, Yes, it did take that long to actually make the video. I'm not quitting making videos. I might be making some different videos as of late because there are different things that are catching my interest lately, and it's where I want to put my creativity. But again, why did it take you three months to make one video that didn't seem that complicated? Well, it actually was that complicated, and sure, I could have finished it faster if I had worked on it 100% every day, um, but I would have gotten burned out of making the video and it would have never gotten finished unless I paced myself and I took, you know, breaks and stuff and only worked on it for a couple, uh, only a few hours every week and stuff like that. But slowly but surely, I did actually get the project done and it was to my liking as I envisioned and I'm really happy with the result. So for those of you who are still interested in how the video was made, I'm going to be going into that right now. Now, Back in 2009, in July, I uploaded a video called Command & Conquer 3 Kane Spam. And that video is right here, in the lower left quadrant of the video. I'll probably make it a little bigger so you can see it. Uh, there. This is that video. And then a year later, I came out with Kane Spam HD, which was the same video, but it was uh, supposedly a more HD. Now, as you can see, it's not HD. Well, these are not to scale at all. These are these are all all these recordings. This one, this one, this one all have the same source file, and that's right here. And you can see the date modified date is six seven two thousand nine. So it was recorded just over one decade ago. So this this and this, which is at right there, the exact same clip. Right here, here, here is, and I'm going to play it back here so you can sort of see it in motion. They're exactly the same clip, the exact, exact same footage that was recorded with Fraps. This is actually not transcoded. This is the exact same um, file. This is actually using the Fraps uh, codec right now to play this back. Uh, as you can see, I've added in some pans there to the footage. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Look, unless you're familiar with the, the old video and exactly how it went down, I mean, I could go on for hours about how this version you're seeing right here is different. But um, this is all the same footage. So why are you saying, wait, wait, this is not exactly what it looked like in the original or in the new video that just came out, and you're sort of right. And uh, these are all the same footage. I didn't use the same footage for the, the new version, and I'll tell you why in a second. The reason why I want to show you this is this project is exactly the project that started the whole thing. And it started out as trying to remake the video once again for a third time. And as you can see, 100% of the footage here is, as you can see, it's pillar boxed. It's, and the only clips in the project are from 2009. Now, that's not right. There's some definitely not 2009 clips, well, for the exception of... Um, the these right here the actual dates here because this is when i re-downloaded it from youtube to get these back you can see this one's 
So I was trying to recreate with the footage again. I had found these files again, and I was like, let me throw it together. Let me make it look better than the original. And if you compare it here, I did, you know, I did like a zoom, a zoom in on the frame there, a pan, and you can see the originals are not panning. And then I think there's like a, I took another piece of the footage that wasn't used in here, which was right here, and then kind of zoom in on it. Uh, and this is not your computer or your, I'm trying to move my mouse so you can sort of see that it's not your computer or, or video stream lagging. This is the footage. The footage is extremely laggy. And that's really only seen in this footage. The new footage does have a little bit of lag for the really intense scenes, but this was pretty much notoriously laggy. And let's hear the audio a little bit here. There's a little bit of a wipe thing there. It didn't quite sync. Now, if that sort of sounds really weird, it's because I'm only going to be using the audio for this on a kind of fair use basis for very short periods of time, just to show you how it lines up. This was before I had rewritten the song. This is where I was just working with the footage and Pendulum, and that's it. That's all I had. Now, the original video, the original videos were just clips and Pendulum. That's all it was. Quite similar to this kind of recreation I was working on. But that's all it was. It was just the original Pendulum recording, and then I sort of cut to it a little bit. Most of it doesn't line up. There, most of it, I was trying to recreate it exactly how it looked. Now, if you see, it's not, these aren't synced perfectly together. This one isn't synced to this one. That's just how it is, since this is a totally different edit. This is a totally different edit. This is a third different edit of the same footage. Some of it, as you can see, is totally different here because I wanted to use the footage differently. But this last part is probably going to be the most iconic part of the whole video, and it is that final ion cannon hit. And as you can see, for all three, it's all matched up, synced up, and then it fires and the behemoths go down. Now what's important about this footage is that the way it works with the audio is entirely uh, coincidental. I'll raise the volume up here, you can sort of see what happens. Okay, you couldn't really hear it because of the lower quality, but basically the audio goes and when the guitars chime in, then the beams start turning. So you can sort of hear it there. So, and then once it finishes, the beams come together. So, as you can see, I really liked that scene. I didn't even in intend to line it up that well. It just kind of did. And I was like, whoa, that's awesome. The problem with that footage is, is that uh, it's totally lagged out. So the timing on it is different from my fresh version of the recording that I made with all three of um, the Ion Cannon hits. That actually played back in f almost full speed with the exception of when the nukes, the, when the Ion Cannons went off at the end, and then it did actually lag for a bit, but it's not this just chugging, terrible... I mean, I had a um, Core 2 Duo at the time when I recorded this, and I had a NVIDIA 9800 GT uh, M in my laptop from 2008. And now I got some better hardware and I can play the game better, but the game does is totally capped off at 30 frames per second. So any even the smoothest footage, go back to the mama. Oh, that actually is pretty slow. I don't know what's making it so slow. It's probably this. Uh, making it lag? I don't, I don't know. I... I I don't, I don't even know. That's, that was supposed to be kind of smooth, at least. I don't even know what's smooth anymore, because it's, everything's just so laggy with all this footage. So this is what I was going to do, and I don't remember when I started this project, but this is what I was going to, to do, and I was just kind of messing around with the footage, and I'm like, man, I'll make it look better, and maybe I'll release it or something. I didn't really know. I set it aside, stopped thinking about it. I don't really know what got me to open this project again, to work on it again, but um, I did. Um, 
And then that's when I started writing this. And this is um, the lyrics sheet from Dan's Spam. So what I did is uh, I started, I had the idea, and I don't remember at what stage it happened, but I had the idea to write some parody lyrics to it. And I didn't really know where this was going. I just kind of, like, started. Now, this is the original lyrics from the song. You can hide your eyes, you can dim the lights, but they are watching. I made parody versions of the lyrics in relation to Command & Conquer subject matter. You can guard, guard your tip, NG's on the spikes, but not as cloaking. Uh, other things that are somewhat similar. Just leave this place behind, just leave the husks behind. I'll clear. It'll clear your bloodshot mind. You'll save some young, bright minds. They only wanted your life on demand. The barracks gives you their lives on demand. This is a better way. Spam is the only way. So I, I tried to keep it with the same, um, and reusing some of the same words as the original. I mean, that's how parodies work, I guess. Um, uh, so you can compare the two. They're very similar. Even the text, the f shape of the text documents are pretty close as well. So I, I, I think I did a pretty good job there trying to squeeze some subject matter from Command & Conquer into a pendulum song and have it work. So I wrote that up and then was like, holy shit, I got to build a whole video around this. And so at first I thought, okay, well, I can just write the song together, record my voice and stuff. And then I didn't really know what I was going to do with the footage. I thought maybe I would just keep the footage the same, just have it, you know, playing in the background like this or something like this. And it would just have the song going in the background while a bunch of crazy shit was happening. And then I would leave that hitting exactly where it was supposed to and other things that were synced up with the music, like the initial new kit here. And for those who, who didn't watch the other one. Well, that's not lined up at all. Well, it's supposed to be. I don't know why it's not now. Well, and it doesn't really matter. So I, I thought I would just use the same footage. I wouldn't change it. But as the scope of the project got more complicated... Then I was like, wait a minute, if I'm going to have these very specific lyrics, I'm going to have to have some visuals to back them up. And I mean, all of these lyrics referred to visuals that could exist in the game. It wasn't fan fantastical. It could happen. So I made the decision to start recording footage from the game. And that was probably the most arduous part of the whole project. Uh, just because uh, it was a pain in the ass. And I did take some shortcuts along the way. Those of you who are familiar with Command & Conquer will know that I did cheat a little. But not using cheat codes, we'll get into exactly how I kind of cheated a little bit. But actually, the cheating itself actually took a bit of work to get, the <laughs> to get that working, actually. It was a whole another project, another whole another piece of software I had to use. So this is where it all started, was with the lyrics here. So, but before I could implement the lyrics and record them, I needed a backing track to record on, too. Now, I could do that with the original um, soundtrack itself, but then you'd have Rob Swire's lyrics there, and then uh, I'd have the two vocal tracks clashing. So I needed to have a instrumental backing track for me to sing on top of and then have it work. So this brings us to the transcription phase of the project and this right here is open mpt this is what i've kind of been doing some music projects in lately and i decided to make the entirety of granite by pendulum in tracker in module in in demo scene whatever you want to call it i may i transcribed the entire song and you can see that there's actually quite a lot of patterns up here now this is one of the things i like the most about writing music in Tracker or putting transcriptions down a Tracker is that you can use, you can write down a pattern and if it's used anywhere else in the song, like it is here, 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 you can just insert that pattern and just use the building blocks of the song to actually 
put it together without having to re-enter notes for a whole different part. Now, of course, you could copy-paste in something like uh, your everyday digital audio workstation, like FL Studio or something like that, and just copy-paste it, but this is just another way of looking at it, and it kind of makes me feel like it really scratches that OCD itch that, and, and it cures the PTSD I have from using Logic Express, which had some terrible snap to grid system shit that haunts my nightmares. And this totally eliminates that because everything is already on a grid permanently. So I can play back. I'm gonna turn this down a little bit because it's... So as you can see, I can skip around in the song. That's the beginning of the song. I mean, I could just go through and show you exactly what I did, but you sort of get the idea. It took a lot of time to do this. If you want to look at some of the samples I use. You can guide your tib and she's on the spikes but not his cloaking. So that's, this was uh, an idea I had would, was to integrate the vocals into the actual tracker file. It didn't work out well and the quality, this was probably actually one of my better recordings of that line. When I actually went to record audio, my voice sounded like ass and that leads into sort of uh, another part of this. You can see some sort of instrument envelopes I have here. One of the more interesting of one would be the this one. And had I not been using Mod Plug Tracker, I really wouldn't have known how to replicate that. Um, if you take a look, this is the volume over time. And then if we go to this, this is the pitch over time. And this is, and it's being able to make stuff like this with Mod Plug Tracker makes me just love it even more. It makes me never want to go back to something else, even though they have this these capabilities in different forms. I guess this just jives better with how my brain works. I guess the arpeggio here that didn't I couldn't get it to sound exactly like it did in the original, but. minor arpeggio. And it's just going up one, three, five, like that, just very rapidly. And I might release this so that other people can have it and mess with it and remix it and whatever. There's not really any need to, to lock this down or anything because, you know, it's not even my song anyway. So that brings us to the vocals. Now, since the backing track had been completed in Mod Plug Tracker, the only thing left to do was the vocals. Now, at the time, I didn't have a digital audio workstation for Windows outside of Audacity. And so I thought, eh, maybe I can really fudge it and just record audio in Audacity alongside my backing track. Well, it didn't turn out very well. Turns out I'm not as good at singing as I thought I was. Bone conduction does some magical things. If you can hear yourself sing. That's what gave me the idea to say, oh, well, maybe I could just do all the lyrics in uh, Deck Talk. Here's a little lower in the document. The beats per minute of the song is 174. But here <clears throat> you can see I started to write up some phoneme code here for Deck Talk. And I've calculated that a whole note at 174 beats per minute is 1336 milliseconds. Half note is 668 milliseconds, dot a quarter, blah, 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 blah. That was all more or less a waste of time. And I think I've demonstrated this back in my old Deck Talk video from a while back, where I kind of show how, hey, these numbers don't actually mean the right thing because the consonants actually take up some amount of time. And so I thought, oh, well, I'll get clever and I'll make some of the consonants. I'll man I didn't do it here, but I manually set the consonants to be a specific duration. What I found out through measuring audio samples, which I had never tried to do before, is it doesn't matter how long it, uh, you set a consonant is, it will not be accurate. It'll either be longer 
or uh, potentially shorter, depending. So all these numbers mean totally total shit. So I thought I could just say oh, 86. This first one is a 16th note, so I'll have it 86, and then I'll say, oh, but the constant eases up some, so I'll, I'll make it uh, like 10, 10 milliseconds for the consonant, and then I'll do 76 for the actual vowel part that's sustained on the note. But that doesn't actually work because 10 milliseconds just gets auto stretched out to like 100 milliseconds or something like that, stupid, or 50, and so it that's just something that Deck Talk does. You can't change that. Unless, I guess, you really get into coding it. And I was really studying the the in-depth documentation that came with my original deck talk card and its, and its help files. And there wasn't too much about how long a consonant is. I think that's just how that works, or it's based on your speaking rate. And then if you change the speaking rate, that, that changes everything. And then I really, I don't even, I don't want to go there. So, the, so what I ended up doing is um, I did actually... This is all the phoneme code for the whole song. I did try to get it as close as possible, but eh. But long story short, it didn't line up. And I didn't have a good solution for time correcting the audio that came out of this. Because if I play this back... This is a demonstration oh, of shut your goddamn text. If I play some of this back... You can guard your tip and she on the spikes, but not dislocate. It sounds pretty close, and that's because it is. And that's what pretty much saved me a lot of heavy lifting when it came time to time correct. But you can see on this one, I only used the same exact duration for each one here. So if I plug this in instead... I know you really try to Actually, that's supposed to be like that. But one of these, I don't remember which one it was. Uh, it could have been this one. I made all the notes exactly the same length just because I didn't have enough, like, verbiage to work with. There, like, there was a snippet that was just too short. I couldn't stretch it at all. So I made them, like, all... It looked ended up looking like this, where they were all exactly the same length, and I just stretched them accordingly. And that is really the best way to do it if you want to do deck talk vocals, is just make it all the same length notes, have them sustain a little bit. If you want it to be longer, make it longer. If you want it to be shorter, you can, whatever. The constants are going to be constants. You're going to have to do some heavy lifting. And I spent a fuckload of time actually doing the time correction. Now, this is the beauty where it all came together. This is Cakewalk by Band Lab. Uh, Cakewalk Express back in 2003 is when I first started getting into um, MIDI sequencing. And, and I got my MIDI keyboard. And uh, I'm actually still using the... Uh, I actually used the USB to MIDI port um, piece of hardware, the Uno, while I was making this project that the original Cakewalk came with. And I actually have the original Cakewalk still on my computer, uh, Cakewalk Express. I'll show you the difference, the 2003 version of Cakewalk that I used versus the, um, so this is what Cakewalk used to look like, and this is what it looks like now. The, the, this version runs on like Windows 98 and shit. But if you take a look at some of the menus here, like this one, and you look at some of these icons, and then you go over to this one, and you look at some of these icons, they're pretty similar, and some of them are just outright the same, have not changed for years. You can look at the About Cakewalk, and this says Build Version 2019, and then this one has an About of 1999. So it's... It's still alive and kicking, and this is what I, back in 2003 when I was still a kid, uh, I was messing around with MIDI sequencing, and it was uh, it really fun. And uh, now it all has culminated in the newest version, which is pretty much feature parody with Logic Express. And oh my god, that is amazing in a free piece of software that runs on PC. I've been waiting for this for a long time, and although this software pissed me off, to hell and high water because it was crashing during the the final bounce I, I did finally figure it out and got it to work so this is the uh the time correction here let me stretch this out so you can see it a little bit better this is uh, these are this is the all solo it so you can sort of see it here you can guard your tip and she's on the spikes but not dislocate so you can see just how much i had to edit that to make it jive with the rest of the recording because it uh, kind of wasn't. It didn't matter how 
much I scrutinized the numbers here, always it would be wrong. And the number of hours I put in painstakingly editing every single one of, you know, every single word, and even parts of words. So, like, like we're not just talking about words, we're talking about syllables that I had to space you can it. The spikes, but that is so this is one word, cloaking. I don't know if I'm going to find a triple, but some some of them play back good. And almost all of them, you can see there's a percentage on each of these clips. One's 98, one's 119. That's how much they're stretched or um, shortened. And you can actually hear some of the artifacting on this one. Oh, I already modified it. Whoops. Uh, you can sort of hear some artifacting there because I stretched it too much. Um, especially on this other one. Yeah, so... No, I it's it is noticeable, but if you don't know what you're listening for, you're not gonna notice it. I notice it because I've I've intimately worked with Deck Talk for a lot of years. I know what it sounds like. Now, I've done this cheating stuff before when I did tender lies deck talk. I had no choice. I had to. Now, perhaps there's some badass motherfucker who um can figure this shit out and make it work. That ain't me. That's not me. I thought it was me. I thought I could do it. Deck talk just isn't a precise science. It uh, is deliberately imprecise because that is the nature of the human voice, and it's trying to emulate that. So that's just the way it is. And for some reason, I have this like performance chart here that I never saw before. So now here's here's the real kicker. This took so long, and it was constantly. The problem is, is the way his voice is, or its voice is, it never sounds right. It never sounds like it's on beat. And I was just tweaking this for hours. I just sit here. I'd be, I'd be talking to people while I'd be doing it too, because I, I just was just working on it, working on it, working on it. This process took days to actually just get that done, and. Oh my god. There was some like popping that was happening. I had to do some enveloping there. But yeah, this is again, this is one one little piece of the whole project. And it took so long of manually stretching them and matching them up to um my vocal track here, which I recorded of myself so I could isolate the the vocals from the original recording. This is a different um, but I think that something's wrong with that track, but Whoa. okay, but you, you get the idea. So down here, these are the instrument tracks. Now they all look like audio tracks and they are. And basically what you can do for mod plug tracker is you can export one channel at a time. So there's one that's a lead one. And I split up all my, my track, my channels to different instruments in mod plug tracker to make this process easier and uh, easier to, to work on when you're transcribing and easier to export because they all get exported out into separate instruments. And then, uh, so then I used the um, equalization and effects of uh, Cakewalk, really basic stuff. And then I uh, did some mixing and mastering. And you can see there's a bunch of effects there for some of it was for the vocals. And some of it's for the uh, the instruments. And if I play it back, I don't know why there's so much flanger all of a sudden. This is the final call with the last blues. No idea what I did. So that made it sound more bassy. You can see I have a very aggressive um, EQ curve there that I don't even think it's turned on. I think this was actually my final e EQ here, and that was the final exported EQ. Uh, obviously, none of this is perfect. The the mix itself, I think I just took an afternoon to fix to to finish. Um, I just knocked it out. Now people can spend hours on this. This is a, this is a real art form. I really do not understand mixing um, shit, compressors, uh, making it sound good, and making the kick drum really pop out of the recording. I've I've watched a bunch of uh, tutorial videos. I can't really wrap my head around it. It's like like it's like uh, 
building circuits and electronics. I just can't wrap my head around it sometimes. So it's kind of it's kind of rough. But I can I'm sort of stumbling my my way through it, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't work, just by doing it. So yeah, that's that's that project. And so what I did is I exported the file from here, or at least I tried to. What ended up happening was I couldn't do that. because of a problem with the audio time correction. Now, for those of you who aren't aware of what time correction does, is it uses different types of algorithms to change the length of a piece of sound without changing its pitch. Because if you changed its pitch, then you'd change the note in the song, and then you'd have just a terrible mess on your hands of all wrong notes. Now, Cakewalk has a feature where you can change the stretch method. They call it method, algorithm, whatever you want to call it. So there's online render and offline render. So online render is, I have it set to elastic efficient. I, it doesn't, it, this could be anything. Elastic efficient is what it uses when it's playing back in real time. So when I press the play button, what you just heard, that's using elastic efficient. When it's offline and I'm rendering it into a bounced file, it uses a totally different renderer. This was the actual problem. This isn't the default setting. The original setting, I believe, was Elastic Pro or Elastic Efficient. And whenever these were turned on and there was, you know, content that was stretching, it crashed Cakewalk. I had no idea what it was doing. And the weird thing is, is that it was able to render some of them, but then there would be like a random single one that it would crash on. And I didn't figure that out until I like spread all the clips on a different tracks and it was a fucking mess. Here's what that looked like. This is me trying to figure out which clip was actually causing the problem. And what I found out, obviously, was it, it wasn't any particular clip. It was just the, the render method was causing Cakewalk to crash. I don't know if anybody else has had this problem, and I haven't posted this on any forums or anything, but um, if, you, if you're having that problem with Cakewalk, um, that, that fixed it for me. So, yeah. So I had, what would happen was, it, you see these how these tracks are frozen. I can unfreeze them, and then it turns back into clips here, into a bunch of clips. And if I were to set the rendering method back to um, the wrong one, and then try to try to freeze this again, which means it's going to process every single piece of audio there and put it into one solid clip so that it saves on processing power, uh, that would that process right there would actually cause it to crash. So, so I would split the clips up so it would look more like this. And I'd split them up, and then I would freeze this one, wait, and then I'd save it, and then I'd freeze the next one, and it'd succeed, and I'd save it, and I'd do the next one, and then it would crash. And then what I'd have to do, I'd have to go back, reload it, and then figure out which one, okay, so I'll just try rendering half of it then. And so let's just freeze this, and then if it would crash, I'd, I'd keep going. And eventually, I'd keep doing that until I got down to just one clip that made it crash. And so I'm like, what is wrong with this one clip? I re-stretched it from something else and got it back, and then it didn't make it crash anymore. And so that was a whole, like, day and a half gone and like really demotivation to work on the project because like i can't even get a test render out because it it keeps fucking crashing it was just the the stretch method so uh that would that's one of the hang-ups i kind of had with the project so back on this one some listeners out there who have a keen ear may have noticed that there was a different voice in here you see that orange orange here and then we got the orange over here let me play this that doesn't sound like deck talk does it for those who don't know what that is that is that is from an atari st now i don't have an atari st but i do have an atari st emulator the uh, atari st emulator is so janky that the Atari ST emulator is so... Oh, Christ, what's... All right. The Atari ST emulator is so weird that I have to do it like this. Oh, there's a little app in here called ST Speech, and it's the Atari 520 ST Speech Synthesizer, and it doesn't work when you alt-tab out of it. God fucking damn it.
Let's see if I can do this again. Oh my god. You see what I have to work with here? Let's see if it'll work now. No, it will not, because fuck the world, I guess. Now, I don't know, can I, like, properly get out of this? I'd, I'd really... Oh, I fixed it. Okay, okay, now it works. Yes, it's working. I fucking love this thing. <laughs> Big thanks to Akapuku for showing me this, giving me this back in the day. Amazing shit. And this voice is very nostalgic to me because it's the voice that was used in the Gumby movie for scenes when they're interacting with the computer. Now it's not the exact same voice, I understand. Calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate. Type. Turl. Ah! But it's pretty close, and it has the same origin, roughly, I want to say. But yeah, it's the Atari 520 speech synthesizer. Now, as you can see, I did uh, timing correction. Well, let's see if I can even get out of this damn thing now. You can see I also did some timing correction here, because there is some rhythm to the part where... Um, I guess it's Rob Swire. But here, this is a part where he's screaming. So instead of screaming, I just change the voice to something that's atonal. Or without pitch, I guess. I don't know what the right word for that would be, but you can hear right here. Wait, why is that? Oh, because it's muted as well. So if I mute our Atari guy here, you can hear that he's just, he's yelling this part. He's not even singing it. He's saying, this is a better way. But he's not, he's not singing. So I figured, instead of having, like, Paul just sing it, because if, let's see, Paul. All I was going to have for him was, oh god, what is happening? Spam is the only way. That's how it is going to have him say. I wonder if Content ID can pick that up. That'd be really fucking annoying. But I thought it sounded pretty lame when he just said, Spam is the only way. I made him, you know, it sounded way fucking more badass. I don't know why it sounds like ass right now, but... Uh, something's wrong. I don't know what it is. Uh, program, the, the, I probably messed up the project when I was kind of showing you stuff in here, so I'm not going to save it or anything. So that's pretty much the whole project you have. Let me zoom so you can see everything at a glance. You have, uh, this was just my lineup track this is this is this this is just this is just this spread apart and the reason i did that of course was to mix it easier have, have the lows low have the highs high you know stuff like that apply effects where needed you have um uh atari st you have deck talk you have my little beatbox thing there for a second you have uh, me screaming sort of me Sustaining a note, that's my vocal there. Um, there's Atari ST again. And there's my initial... And if you're wondering what that sound is, it wasn't actually in the original song on the original video, because uh, I didn't have the original version of the song that actually had the, the bloopy intro here. If you want to listen to uh, this, and I can't tell what tracks are soloed or not, because... Uh, I think it's funny that in all of these years, they have the same fucking zooming buttons. This exact same zooming buttons. In fact, I don't even think they changed the. They barely changed the positions. Like, what the fuck? Anyway, uh, this first bloopy part here. This part might be actually kind of hard to hear if this is kind of down a little bit. And then I just kind of did my own rendition of that part. And again, this is cut off in that original version. It kind of just starts, like, right there. 
Oh, I muted it again. God damn it. It just like starts right there or something. But anyway, this is this was my rendition of it. And then it just goes right into it. And I don't know what that kind of like spit sound at the end there is, but yeah, uh, whatever. Okay, so that's the audio um, portion of the video. We haven't even gotten to the video editing portion of the video. I only showed you what the um, what my original plan was for the video, not the actual final cut of the the video was. And the project is apparently big enough, or it has some problems with codecs, because there is the uh, Fraps codec that's super old now. That's chilling in there with some other codecs. It's kind of messy. Now, if you look at the actual project itself down here, it's not that complicated. Uh, there's a lot of junk in here, like a lot, a lot of junk. A lot of fucking clips. Like, good lord. I'm, I'm looking for the, the, the zoom buttons because I'm used to cakewalk now. So... We've got uh, lyrics, 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 um, two super weapons firing on screen at the same time, if it's going to show me that, which it might not. Okay, there. We've got um, on screen text and the combat engineer. Now, some of these things here I do have to explain. So, let me save this to draft half because this is like lagging balls for some reason. Okay, so for this, you can sort of see that, you know, it's not going slow. It's not lagging, but it, it's kind of slow. And you can sort of, and for those of you who are familiar with Vegas, know what these wiggle lines mean. And that means I've done, you guessed it, timing correction. Now see how this kind of looks lagged to shit? It's just kind of choppy. And that's sort of on purpose. If we take this clip and we move it, over here, and then we set the playback rate back to 1, and then we watch it again, you can see that the actual original clip is actually much smoother and happened a lot faster. But the problem was is that it, went, it happened too quickly. The whole firing sequence of the ion cannon was so quick when it was recorded in real time because my computer's so fucking fast now. <laughs> that there wasn't lag anymore, so I had to actually bring the lag back so that some of the scenes made more sense. Now, this is one of the, this is probably one of the first scenes that I remade. This wasn't really a remake. This was just kind of a, my original um, kind of setup here where I would play a, uh, play like a skirmish game, and then I would... You know, build a bunch of units, have them shoot at a single spot, and then nuke them. But the thing about this scene was there's a nuke and an ion cannon. Ion cannon and a nuke. So where'd the nuke come from? You can't fire a nuke as GDI. Well, you can if you capture a Nod base and build a thing. But I didn't do that. I... Uh, I set up multiple computers um, to uh, play network games with myself, and I clicked two mice together at the same time to have them both fire at the same time. Because if you look, I'm actually calling down the nuke, or calling down... Well, let me go to, to this clip, actually. I'm calling down the... You can see this is the reticle for the ion cannon and I'm clicking the button, and my mouse is at the center, which means I've actually clicked it, because otherwise I would have moved it off to the side, because it's kind of in the way. And then, and I didn't want to move it, because it would have moved the camera, or it could have. And then it's firing, but then you also see the nuke, and that was a secondary player. I had a separate computer next to me, and I fired it. So, does that mean, Draga, that you had three computers? firing all of these ion cannons for the final triple super ion cannon? Well, yes and no. If you want to look over here, this was the original um, footage that I, I was going to use um, of all three ion cannons. And this is kind of the legit, and I 
in production of this video. I couldn't make a decision on this, and I well, I made I made a call, and I went with it. And we'll get to it in a second. But this was the footage I didn't end up using um, of sort of the more legit triple ion cannon. And you can see I'm calling it down here, and I do fire it. And the ion cannon, all three ion cannons do fire, but you can see that they're not aligned very well because I had three mice on my desk all next to each other, and I had to click them all at the same time. And I fucked it up like twice before where I, one didn't click. And so if one doesn't click, you've just wiped out a whole army that you now need to rebuild. And uh, I had to do that, and it was a pain in the ass. Now, if, as you can see, when that nuke went off, it was pretty. It was pretty. There wasn't enough stuff being blown up, though. There wasn't enough particles. And there weren't any units because I had already blown them up from my last failed nuke before. So this was going to be my final climactic scene. And I was like, what am I going to do? This is as good as I can get it? I mean, it's going to take me another hour and a half to build the units again. And then if I fuck up the firing sequence, I'm going to have to do it all over again. And then the game's lagging, and sometimes the game crashes when there's too many units. So what do you do? Well, you get a little clever. So if you go back here, and you see all these, not only do you see them firing precisely at the same time, you also don't see the firing reticle on the ground, which anybody who's played a lot of Command & Conquer will probably notice that not happening. You also notice that a lot of the units are in a very... they're all facing in the same direction, at least with the hammerheads and the venoms. They're all kind of facing in one direction. They're sort of haphazardly placed, but they're all kind of facing... let me bring this up just a little bit so you can see some detail. They're all pointing the same way. This, you can't tell that with the Storm Riders because they're circling. And you can't tell it with the stuff underneath them because you have the exhaust plumes from and the dust getting kicked up from both of these, all these aircraft. So you have a bunch of dust everywhere. So you can't actually see the units. There's a bunch of flame tanks here, pit bulls here, and seekers here. And so not only are they lined up, but they're are they all timed perfectly, but they're all um they're all spaced pretty evenly as well. And you're like, well, how the hell did you do that? Well, I think anybody who's familiar with Command & Conquer enough knows I used the map editor to make that happen. And uh, let's actually, and that's also, I used the map editor to do, and, and it should be pretty obvious for some of the scenes, uh, like uh, that scene obviously was a map I was using um, but this one, this is actually the most ridiculous scene in the whole. I actually wanted to show more footage of this, but um, there wasn't enough time like to watch the whole thing. Here's the whole thing of just how many Vertigo bombers and how many rigs, battle bases, I guess, just get destroyed from just all that. Again, that was... I didn't actually build all the battle bases. Uh, I didn't build all the Vertigo Bombers. They were already built, and I just sent them over and while I was recording. Now, now, if we look at the beginning of the final project here, you can see that this frame looks pretty dang familiar uh, from the original version of, the, of Kane's spam back in the day. In fact, it looks so similar that it crashed my <laughs> fucking project. <laughs> Oh man, this happens so frequently, but it looks pretty similar, except uh, what we can see while it's crashing anyway. Um, we can see that it's widescreen, and we can see that it's 1080p. But it's it, all the units are, exact, whoa, are exactly in the same place. And that's because I still had the replay file from all those years ago when this was originally played. I had saved a replay in my Command & Conquer, and I still had the file. I reloaded the replay up into my game and re-recorded the exact same arrangement of units and the exact same nuke. I was planning on making more footage out of the old replays that I have, because I have a bunch of them, uh, but it the problem with replays on the Command on Command & Conquer on Command & Conquer 3 is you can fast forward them but you can't in any way seek to a certain point 
So you can't, it's really hard to get to a specific important point. So what I had to do for this is I had to just point the camera at where the nuke hits and then um, just let it sit there for a while until the nuke finally dropped. Because I have no idea where it dropped. It's not like StarCraft, you can just kind of like scrub through it like it's a video. Uh, you, you can't do that in, in Command & Counter. It doesn't have that ability. And then it, it kind of lags out and then it has to stop and like buffer the data stream coming out of the replay file or something. I don't know. Uh, it, but just because that was such a time consuming process, I didn't actually use that. In fact, I actually cheated a little bit here. Um, I believe it was right here for these two scenes. These two scenes are actually from uh, Tiberium Wars. These are not actually from Kane's Wrath, but you can't really tell because they're, you know, pretty much the same looking. Um, these, are I think the only pieces of footage aside from the uh, original clips here that I threw. I just packed them all at the end of the video, all the 2009 footage clips. And again, these are the original, no transcoding. Um, this is the only one that's in 720p because I, I think they're in 720p because uh, they're from when I was streaming this. So if you, you can actually... Um, go back on my channel and look at the old stream and you may actually find this moment where I was like attacking things and it looked like just normal gameplay. That's really what I wanted to go for, just look a normal looking Command & Conquer gameplay there. Um, and then to go back over here, um, again, this is all the old footage. Um, it's not all the old footage, it's just kind of a kind of a really packed together to get the the most out of it. There wasn't much to work with to begin with. Of course, we have the mama. We have, and then we have a bunch of nukes in order. There's that original climax I added in there as well. And then we have this one, which was not in Kane's spam, but was in another video on YouTube that I made called uh, the double nuke. Um, and the double nuke, and you'll see this footage looks a lot worse. Um, then just the other one right here, or sorry, there, you can see it's very crisp, even though that's 480p, we go to this, and it looks like potato mode. And the reason for that is if I take this, you can see I'm doing, I did some hefty time correction on some of these to help with the timing, but um, if we take this and we go here, we can see that I've cropped this area for some reason. And why is that? Well, let's pan it out and see. Oh, would you look at that? It's a screen recording shot off the screen with my dad's 480p camcorder. Yeah, I recorded this with a camcorder because I knew that uh, it was going to lag too much to actually record it with fraps. I wouldn't be able to get as much footage. And so it was like, the lag proof way to do it and my and if you want to see it at the original uh, playback rate yeah this is a video I used to have on my channel but I don't have any more because it's uh, kind of deleted because it had copyrighted music on it but oh my yeah really pretty looking this is even looks even prettier than the uh, the end the climax because there's just so many units and it kind of like locks up there for a while. And if there's still that audio with it, you could hear me and my friends just going like, whoa, whoa, dude. But yeah, that's, that's that. Okay, this is the Command & Conquer 3 Kane's Wrath world builder software. And uh, this is the map I had to make to make the Kane spam video. Now, you might think that, oh, it's kind of cheating to just use the map editor to do something really cool because that's not what you did back in the day when you were spamming all that shit. True, but I also wasn't working with that many units on that great a scale, and there would have been a way to actually have that happen in a normal game without crashing it out or some other weird shit. Now, this map that I made, obviously, um, it did take me a little bit of time to kind of figure out um, how to actually use the World Builder software, because I had used it way back in the day, but then I forgot everything. Um, and a lot of it was kind of elementary, um, having to place down 
different faction structures. And um, the number one thing is crash mitigation, actually, because if this entire map were to load into Command & Conquer um, with all of the units on it, it, would cra it did crash the game. Um, so some of these uh, objects are only set to appear uh, depending on what uh, player start position you're at. So I think some of them are kind of fucked up right now because for some reason they're floating out in space here and I don't know why. But uh, yeah, they're kind of not lining up. I don't, I don't know what that is. This is supposed to be over here. This is supposed to be here. This is supposed to be here. So depending on which player you are in any given game, only a certain groups of items will actually spawn because they're only, like, for example, this right here, this group of stuff right here was set to, like, Team 1, or I think it was just, like, this bottom here was Team 1, and then Team 2 was this stuff. And the game engine doesn't load in stuff if the team's not there for it. So it basically allowed me to load different parts of the map in, even though it's the same one I'm working off of, by just changing my start position in the game and starting it, and it's like, okay, we're going to be in... You see, these are the battle bases from that scene. And you can see the vertigos. I just flew them right over. And uh, this is our little playpen for the triple nuke. And uh, that's just the fourth player that I don't remember what it's for. And this is the, the split-second uh, harvester explosion um, area. Uh, for those of you who have seen the video, you probably know what it is where the catalyst missile comes down and this all blows up. And the and these are uh, zone troopers that I had to move the zone troopers into the heavy harvesters so that they blow up out of it. It was a really quick thing. I wanted it to be longer, but oh well. Um, and you might see there's some writing here like select harv, crash, gravity stabilizer, crash. I had to hunt down crashes in this as well. Not too much unlike um, Cakewalk and its problems with stretch methods. I had to switch teams. Uh, I, I determined that it was something wrong with these buildings, these screen buildings here. Um, whenever the map would load up, it would just crash the game. <laughs> and so what I found out is that whenever the gravity stabilizer was set to as a team item, it would it would crash the game. So I couldn't. I had to not put gravity stabilizers down when I had the other air structures for the other teams, just because it would just crash it. If I wanted it, I would just build it because I had the drone platforms for uh, for that. So. And to do that, I had to go in here. Well, there's supposed to be a window that is somewhere. And I think it's lost because I just switched my monitors around. And I bet you that um, the world builder reset window positions. Okay. That could help. Let's see. And it's still not coming up. I have no idea why. You need, there's like a sub window that comes up that lets you control a bunch of stuff, but I guess it's not here. But anyway, I had to change the, uh, that's actually going to be a big problem. Hopefully that I resolve that somehow. Uh, but I'd, I'd click on an object, there'd be a properties dialog box, and I could set which team an object was on. So I'd, I'd go in here and I'd select, you know, this, and I'd say, hey, set team this. And then that would only leave these objects, and I'd try to load the map. And then if it would crash, I'd set another one. No, not that team. Until I had, I figured out by process of elimination that it was the gravity stabilizer and not that. That's the warp chasm. Uh, the gravity stabilizer was the thing that was crashing it. And then over here, the harvesters, if you clicked them in engine when the game's running, it would cause the game to crash. And I think that's because I set the properties for these harvesters to sleepy mode. And sleepy mode makes them not move, and because if I had just started the game, they would have started moving and harvesting, or something like that. Because there are, uh, I don't know, there's no, there is a, um, a refinery over there, so they probably would have wanted to, because this is the team player for this, these units, so they would probably have wanted to um, re collect and return the Tiberium. So I had to put them in sleep mode, so they all surrounded the. Um, whatever this fucking thing is. <laughs> um, the growth accelerator. Uh, to make it look like, oh, our new god is here. And then they just all die. The catalyst missile. Okay, so, and then of course, I had a little bit of fun with, 
I had to, the first time learning on how to make ramps, which is actually a very intuitive and simple way to make the ramp, although I can't show you a demonstration of this because um, the dialog box isn't coming up for some reason, which I don't know why. Yeah, it might just be totally glitched out, but, you know, you can see I'm kind of modifying the terrain here, like very, very a lot of modifying the terrain, okay. Uh, so I had a, there's a big kind of valley here where all, the, for a, one of the last scenes in the video, where a bunch of units collect in the center. And what I had was I had these channels, these ramps going down from each of the faction's units, and they would kind of funnel down into this area that's at the rally point in there and start making units from all of these different bases, and it would funnel down in. And the problem is, is even though the game didn't crash initially, when I started making, when it would load in all these structures, and I would have enough resources to, you know, make it happen, the game would crash because I would make too many units, and then uh, I'd have to do it all over again. And you might think, well, why didn't you just make the units like you did with the Vertigos? I didn't want the game to crash, and I wanted them to slowly funnel in over time as a time-lapse kind of thing. So that would kind of be harder to um, to either script or do manually. So I didn't want to do that, so just to give a natural look. But what I had to do is I had to only build out of a couple structures, and there wasn't nearly as many units that I wanted going into the center, but that's sort of what we got. And then, of course, the uh, the final, the the or well, it's not really the final. The, the kind of climax of the whole video is right here. You can see that the Venoms and the Hammerheads and the Pitbulls and the Seekers and the Storm Riders are all kind of stacked together. When they spawn in, these will go up to the proper altitudes and such. So now that still doesn't explain just how the ion cannon beams work, and that's probably I'd probably be best suited to give you a demonstration. Good WDA. Okay, so this is probably the most intuitive thing that I love about um, map editing is um, how fast you can actually test your map uh, once you've saved it. Now I've edited the uh, mini map here so I can tell which team wh which map position I'll go into which will spawn the different sets of units. So the battle bases over here and the vertigos are sorry the battle bases is one team and the vertigos is another so the, i actually did that one with two different computers so the battle bases if you want to con control the battle bases and the harvesters um, and all the other sub factions you're going to get in this top corner if you want to control just the vertigos you're going to get there if you want to do the record the tri nuke thing that's like in the background here you want to be in that position and then if you want to be in control of all the bottom area here you're going to have um, going to do the spam there so we're going to do try to because i want to show you that and usually it would have crashed by now if it was going to crash so you can see on the map here that there's nothing there because that stuff did not load in there's no battle bases there's nothing there there's just our stuff right here and i don't know why they're the wrong color now we oh, I guess. Okay, because my that's my my team color is different. Now these are no, actually controllable. Can us. I can actually move these. Who we getting? Well, I could See actually the move them out of the line of fire if I really wanted to. Right but the problem with doing that is that you can crash the game if there's too much stuff going on. Everything is prepared. Too many things selected. So if I were to press the Q key um, to select everything, it might actually crash the game. Now, now you see that I've moved Ashes the units. Will fall. They've kind of spread out a bit. And I'll show you why I didn't want that to happen. Having them all clustered together with the map editor, they don't move when they first spawn in, so they all stay right where I need them to, and I think the game just crashed, actually. Oh, no, it's it's getting there. That's a lot of units. Um, but if the... Uh, it might crash. We'll see. Oh, uh, yep, we're crashing. Uh, too many... Too much pathfinding going on, I'm pretty sure. As soon as they settle here, it might, it might clear up a bit, but... Oh, God. But if they start to spread out like this, that's what their AI tells them to do. But if they're spread out like that, the actual blast radius of the ion cannon is not wide enough to wipe out all these units. And the reason I built these walls here, I'll just show you here because that's crashing. The reason I built these walls is because if they did go wandering off, I'd kind of box them in and they wouldn't go wandering away. I could have made this a lot smaller. 
so that they absolutely could not move. So even if I did tell them, hey, move, they would just turn into a big soupy mess. And then you'd see, as you can see, once they start pathfinding, it's like crashing the fucking game because there's too much stuff going on. And then if I tried to record the nukes now, then, you know, we'd have a horrible, <laughs> horrible problem on our hands. Unit lost. Because it'd be so laggy. So you're probably thinking. Oh, actually, that was pretty damn cool. But you can sort of see that you had some stragglers, some survivors out on the outer reaches here. And if we rotate the camera, we can see that, you know, we had some survivors. So um, probably what most of you are trying to figure out is how the hell did you just pull three ion cannons out of your ass and you're the only um, person in the game and there's only one ion cannon. And that's the magic of scripting, which I'll show you right now. If you want to go up to, again, if it fucking shows me this menu. Okay. So these are the scripts. Since this is the, the try nuke is in player position two, there's something called fire. So under fire, this is really all you need to see. This is the, as complex as the scripting gets. If player has reset the camera, then spawn object iron, ion cannon effect in team player two at position, this, this, and this. Actually, I, you know, counted it down to the, the numbers manually entered them. So they were precisely at the position of these um, rigs that you couldn't actually see, that were right on the dot there. And every time the player resets the camera, it just fires the ion cannons, but it only does it once. Um, there, but I think that's because I, um, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh, I want to show you something. Um, there's something like deactivate, deactivate upon success. That's why it doesn't work. You can't, I can't do it again. But if I uncheck that. And then I were to say, save the map, although I don't really want to now because I think I just fucked it up. Um, I just say, okay, I'm going to save as Ion Beams 2. Okay, saved it. I'm back here. And this is pretty much how easy it is. You can exit the map, skip, continue. And here we have it again. Now, you saw my text went away. It always resaves the shit. And your text goes away. So here's the other Ion Beam line one. And uh, we're going to click play on this. And that's, I didn't even have to restart the game. You can just play it again. And it just works. But what I'm about to do right now will require restarting the game. Okay. So heard you like ion cannons. Check this out. <laughs> yeah, that's one ion cannon activating for each pillar once every 30th of a section? Once every frame. Actually, this is before I do to check that box to deactivate um, all of the units have been destroyed now. They're just, it's in a constant state of firing. Oh god. Now the explosions have started. Hey. Ooh, I can... Whoa. So what you can do is you can go like this, and that actually pauses the game. I thought that was going to crash it. So what you can do is here you can go up to uh, scripts. You got player two, fire, uh, deactivate upon success. Definitely check that if you want to see the script conditions. Actions if true. Um, we can edit it. This is you can. There's so much stuff you can do in here. This is this is what they used to make the campaigns with. 
Um, there's all kinds of stuff you can do, like conditions and scripting and stuff. But this is the extent of what it is. It's super easy. You can't even type in here. You can't even type a script. You have to click on it and manually click what it is, what object you want, what team you want, um, what position. You know, you can't type it. In. It's super easy. Like, su super, like, multimedia fusion kind of stuff going on. Or click and play games factory whatever so let's click OK to that and then save and then all we need to do to fix it is restart we don't even need to get out of we don't need to go back to the menu we can just hit restart it'll reload the map with our modifications let's see if it does it nope I can keep clicking it and this is what it's supposed to look like so, yeah, that, that's how easy you, it is to do uh, map editing. You can just go in there, and just, all you have to do is restart, and try it again, try it again. Just restart, 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 try it again. I love it. I love this software. I wish back in the day I was doing nothing. I, if I was good at this software and I could figure it out, I would have been doing nothing but making maps um, all day and then playing them with my friends uh, when we did LAN parties back in the day after school, they'd all come over to my house and we'd hang out over the weekend. Like, uh, it was crazy shit. We'd stay up really late eating taquitos and chimichangas. Uh, so it was, it was some good times for sure. But uh, I really wish we did more map editing because um, we did a couple of maps with the map editor, but we really didn't know what we were doing with them. And they just ended up looking like crap. It would just look like the default map. Um, we, it just the whole map just looked gray like this, and there was like some Tiberium at the bottom and the top, and then that was our map. We just made like all blue Tiberium, blue Tiberium. I don't think I have the map anymore, but uh, yeah. So I have now lost track of just how many pieces of software were involved in this production. And to start with, we of course have um, Command and Conquer. Technically, was a piece of the production. We, of course, had OBS that I'm using to record this with. We had Notepad to uh, write the lyrics and the phoneme data. We had uh, the DT demo app to actually record the vocals. Open Mod Plug Tracker to write the backing track. Cakewalk to uh, compile all the audio together. Of course, uh, uh, Movie Studio Platinum 13. And then, of course, the Grand Conquer World Builder. At least, I think that's everything. I'm for Oh! Where's Winston as well, but that kind of like is hard to put on the screen right now because I have to like move it around and it fucks up with my capture software. So, oh, and uh, Movie Studio Platinum just crashes. <laughs> uh, movie, movie, movie Studio Platinum crashed because there's too much shit going on. Uh, every one out of three launches of this project, which, you know, is the main project crashes just for some reason and sometimes uh you didn't see it here but sometimes for some reason it just wants to say fuck off to the uh fraps codec and sometimes just doesn't show any on any video in a given clip until you restart the program <laughs> so that i uh, definitely had some challenges and some frustrations but oh my fucking god this project was huge as shit look at all this so if you got so again, if anybody has listened through this much of the video, you're a true fan, and I really appreciate you. And you're the real person who I want to make videos for, aside from doing it for myself to have fun and be creative. Um, that's that's the real truth. If you're hearing this now, and you care about it, and you didn't just use it to go to sleep with, I guess, which you know uh, you're pretty awesome too, but. Uh, you're the you're the true fans for sure. If you if you went this far and listened to this, you're the kind of people I want to make videos for, um, because you care about the stuff that I make, even if it's not always weed, and even if it's not always SSD, and even if it's not always computer stuff. I feel that there's some cool stuff I can show you that's you know not always that stuff. So this kind of stuff interested me, so you know I went ahead and did it. So uh, that sort of brings this video to a conclusion and i mean i'll say it again do you believe me now that this took three months 
so, sometimes I had I had to learn all new software. I didn't know how to use Cakewalk at the beginning of this. I didn't know how to use World Builder at the beginning of this. Um, I didn't. So I, I had to learn how to use these pieces of software and then do something useful for them with them and then implement them, record this with OBS. And you can sort of see what, what it looks like in real time now. There is a lag there when it fires. I had to kind of edit that out a little bit. But yeah. Probably could have done it from a different angle. That probably would have been cool too. Well, whatever. It'll start running better when, when all the dust clears. There we go. Nice and smooth. But my mind would have been totally fried if I worked on this every single day and tried to get it out within a month or less, trying to keep on the same schedule as before. But if you guys remember what I did in the last video, and by last video I don't mean Kane spam, I mean if you guys remember what happened in the last last video, which was um, Linux, Manjaro, and Mint 1, the 420 video, um, I killed Dark Draga, who was kind of this guy who loomed over my head and always heckled me and said that I always needed to stay on a schedule. And he was basically the voice of YouTube and the voice of, I guess you could say bad commenters, but uh, mainly the voice of YouTube that was basically saying, you will do things our way and you will follow our rules or you will not succeed, I guess. Yeah. Not really too happy with the whole YouTube thing and how um, it kind of seems to force creators into always creating content all the time. Um, just taking my time, doing things when I feel like them, do what things that I like to do. And that's that's really all I wanted to do with this channel when I started. And it might not reward me, it might not recommend my videos, and I might not get a lot of views. And people who are subscribed to me and maybe have even rung the bell might not even get my notifications because it says I'm not deemed worthy because I'm not uploading as much as PewDiePie or T-Series or whatever the hell. I'm not a media conglomerate that can put out five or six videos a day. I don't have a, a whole staff to do that. And I wouldn't want to do that either because I don't want to put out garbage content all the time. I just I want to put out stuff that I like and that I think is good. So thanks everybody for watching. Um, um, thank you so much for sticking with me all these years. It's been a pretty big adventure and uh, it's going to keep going. It, things are going to be a little bit different than they used to be. But uh, I'm glad you're sticking with me regardless. Thanks for being there, guys. Have a good one. I'll see you next time.